Hello, everybody. Welcome to Unit 1 Biology Area Study 1. Today we are looking at cellular structure and function. And the dot points that we're going to be focusing on today is looking at cells as a basic unit of life, looking at the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, looking at surface area to volume ratio, looking at cell organelles for plant and animal cells and their functions, um, and identifying the structure and function of the plasma membrane and how different things can cross the plasma membrane as well. Remembering that these videos are a summary um, for revision, not to learn all of your content off of, but they are good to use for study. All right, looking at our first component, we are looking at cells. So we know that cells make up every living thing, okay? That is one of the main parts of what we call our cell theory, okay? So we say that all living things are made up of cells. They are basically the smallest, most basic unit of life, and that every cell that exists come from pre-existing cells. In terms of cells, we can break them up into two categories. So we've got our prokaryotic cells and we've got our eukaryotic cells, okay? So when we talk about cells, these are the two categories that we are discussing. So when we talk about prokaryotes, prokaryotes, as you can see, have a very simple structure, okay? So they're single-celled organisms. They don't have a nucleus. Their DNA is usually circular as well. So an example of a prokaryotic cell um, would be your bacteria. Eukaryotic cells, however, are a lot more complex, okay? Um, they're basically single-celled or multi-celled. Um, organisms and they do have a nucleus and inside that nucleus is where we find the DNA, okay? Um, and they usually have a whole bunch of other organelles which we're going to talk about in terms of each having their own specialized function as well. And when we talk about eukaryotic cells, we can split them. Usually we talk about animal and plant cells but also fungi protists are also eukaryotic, okay? So this diagram here kind of sums that up for you. The main other things to sort of keep note of are the major differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic. So knowing about your membrane-bound organelles, in eukaryotes they're present, but in prokaryotes they're not there. In terms of DNA and where it's found, in eukaryotes it's in the nucleus, whereas in prokaryotes it's usually sort of free-floating um, and circular. In terms of the organism nature, eukaryotes can be unicellular, so they can be made up of one cell, or they can be multicellular, made up of many cells. Whereas prokaryotes, they are unicellular. In terms of size, eukaryotes are a lot larger, prokaryotes are a lot smaller, and their method of cell replication, which we'll go through a little bit later, is how cells divide. Um, eukaryotes undergo this process called mitosis and meiosis, whereas prokaryotes undergo a process called binary fission, which we will get to. All right, looking at surface area to volume ratio. So we know that surface area is the area that might surround a particular shape, okay? We talk about mass, and volume is the amount of stuff that can fit inside of that 3D shape. So in terms of cell size and cell structure, they all really vary, and they're going to vary based on probably what their function is going to be, okay? So in terms of having small cells, we want small cells, maybe, because they will be beneficial for the exchange of materials, okay? And this can occur efficiently and effectively when we have a good surface area to volume ratio. Distances to travel within the cell are going to be a lot smaller, um, and so transport of molecules can be a lot faster. So we usually say that a greater surface area and volume ratio, okay, so a greater surface area and a smaller volume is going to lead to cells that can exchange materials more efficiently with their environment. So we want a high surface area to volume ratio, okay, which means um, that they're able to transport substances across their border a lot more efficiently. Okay, so the main thing here is knowing the greater surface area and a smaller volume, okay, which is a high surface area to volume ratio. All right, organelles. So organelles are basically the organs of a cell, okay? That's the way that I like to think of it. And they're all inside the cell. They all have their own function, okay? So cells are made up of different structures that work together that increase the efficiency of the cell, the ability of it to survive and do its job. 
Okay, so those compartments, they're what we call the organelles, okay? And they all have a specific function. In terms of comparing our two um, eukaryotic cells that we look at, so our plant cell and our animal cell, there's three major differences that we refer to, okay? The first major difference is that plant cells have a cell wall, and a cell wall is only found in a plant cell. Another thing that a plant cell has that an animal cell doesn't are chloroplasts, okay? And the third thing is plant cells have a larger vacuole, okay, than animal cells. So if these three organelles, either a large vacuole, a cell wall, or a chloroplast, are present in a cell, straight away, you're going to be like, yep, that is a plant cell. So a cell wall basically is for structure and support. Chloroplasts are involved in photosynthesis, that is the site of photosynthesis, and vacuoles are basically the storage of water, okay, and liquids. In terms of other organelles that exist, okay, we've got the nucleus, which can be seen here, which is sort of the control center of the cell, that's where the DNA is found. We've got the rough ER, which are these here, um, that contain ribosomes on them, so they're used to transport proteins. The smooth ER, okay, is this one here. They do not have any ribosomes on them, so they transport more so lipids. The Golgi body, um, which can be seen over here, is where packaging and transport occurs of different proteins. Lysosomes um, are involved in cell death. Um, mitochondria are involved in production of ATP. Okay, so you can see here lots and lots of mitochondria. And we've got a structure of a mitochondria here as well. So this is one where you need to know the internal structure of it. It is made up of a double membrane. So it's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Um, they've got ribosomes in them as well, which means they can also make their own proteins. Um, they've got circular DNA. So they may have once had bacterial origins. Um, and we've got here, the important part is the cristae and the matrix. Okay, so the cristae is like these folds and the matrix is the liquid inside of the folds. We've then got the chloroplast, which is involved in photosynthesis, which we can see here. Okay, and again, that also has a double membrane and it has two particular components. It's got the stroma, and the thylakoid discs, which make up the granum. So lots and lots of these thylakoid discs make up a grana. Um, we've also got vacuoles, which we said were for storage of water, and vesicles, which are used for transporting proteins to the cell membrane to allow them to then be um, expelled out of the cell. So I mentioned ribosomes. These are important for protein synthesis. The cell wall for structure and support, and the plasma membrane is controlling what comes in and out of the cell. And we're gonna go through what that means in a little bit more detail. All right, so the plasma membrane is basically the structure that surrounds both plant and animal cells, okay? It's controlling what moves inside of the cell. And it has two major components. It's made up of what we call a phospholipid, and it's made up of proteins. So most proteins that are in the cell membrane, okay, are sort of embedded within the membrane, whereas others might also be attached on the surface of the membrane. The overall structure, though, is made up of a phospholipid. So what a phospholipid is, is basically this over here. It's made up of a phosphate head and a lipid tail. And you might be familiar with hearing some vocab that's related to this. So when we talk about our phosphate head, okay, we usually say that the phosphate head is polar and it's hydrophilic. So that means it faces the liquidy part. We've then got the tail, which we refer to the non-polar tail, okay? And that is usually, well, it is, hydrophobic and that's what the part that's pointed inwards here okay so in our plasma membrane you can see that this part here are our lipid tails and these circles are our phosphate heads okay looking at the hydrophilic b 
being the heads and the hydrophobic being the tails pointed inwards. One half of this, so just this section here, we call it a phospholipid. We call it a phospholipid bilayer when there's two components, okay? So we've got one phospholipid and then another phospholipid joining the bottom part as well. Polarity, so you may have heard me just say polar and non-polar, has to do with the attachment between bonding, okay? Um, which we can see here as well. Moving on to how things can actually transport across the membrane, okay, is different types of molecules can transfer based on their own properties as well. Okay, so features that allow a molecule to diffuse across the plasma membrane is that polarity. Okay, so non-polar or uncharged or hydrophobic molecules, they can pretty much cross the plasma membrane because most of that plasma membrane itself is non-polar. As you could see, most of it is made up of this lipid tail, the inner bit. So if something's non-polar, or uncharged or hydrophobic, it can go straight through the plasma membrane. So things like oxygen, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, or lipids, they're pretty easy to transfer through. In terms of size as well, it's gonna be dependent on whether it can transfer through. So small molecules like water, they can pretty much go straight through. However, if a small molecule is charged, so like an ion, then it can't cross through simply. It's going to have another method of transporting across the membrane. So we have basically four major ways that we talk about um, movement across the plasma membrane. The first one is simple diffusion. So simple diffusion is if you have your plasma membrane, diffusion is the movement of those molecules directly across that plasma membrane from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration, okay? Oh no, we're scribbling everywhere. All right. And then an example of that is oxygen. So there's no energy required in this process. We go straight from a high concentration to a low concentration. So you can see these red ones are moving from right to left. And these blue ones are moving from left to right because it's going from a high to a low concentration. Facilitated diffusion moves across the same gradient, okay, across the same direction, which is the concentration gradient, um, from high to low concentration, but it requires a facilitator. And that facilitator is a protein channel, okay, or a channel protein, which is usually for maybe molecules like glucose that can't travel directly through the plasma membrane, but need a protein channel to um, support them, okay, so a facilitator. So the big difference between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion is a facilitated diffusion requires a protein channel. Both these processes don't require energy. Osmosis, okay, relates to water movement. So it's the movement specifically of water from a region of high concentration to low concentration when we talk about water concentration. But if we talk about solute concentration, we have to talk about from a low solute to a high solute concentration. So you need to be careful with your wording here. So it's low solute to high solute or high water to low water. When we talk about osmosis, you may have come across the terms hypertonic, hypotonic and isotonic, which can also relate to the movement of water. So if we look over here, we can see that with a hypotonic solution, okay, there is more water inside the cell and that cell is more likely to burst, okay, more likely to lyse. Um, in an isotonic solution, we would say that a cell has equal amounts of water coming in, equal amounts of water going out, and in a hypertonic solution, we would say that water is moving out more than water is moving in. So it would mean that your cell would become a lot more shriveled. So there's different words to describe that in an animal cell compared to a plant cell. In a plant cell, they want that. That's the turgid normal, okay? If it's hypotonic, if it's isotonic, it will become flaccid. And if it's a hypertonic, it's gonna become plasmalized, which means it's not enough water in there. 
The last method of transport is active transport, and that's for charged particles. So that is against the concentration gradient, and we're moving now from a low to high concentration, and it requires energy. There is our summary. Any questions, leave them below.